Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and I am joined today with a new guest, not a new guest in my life. I've actually known you, Ashley. How many years have I known you? Three or four years. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, were, you were originally my first Ashtanga teacher. Did you do the beginner course? I did the beginner course with you. That yes. is amazing. Yeah, before I was ever I had a YouTube platform, that was before the world shut down on us. And I never would ever have thought I'd been on YouTube. So yes, I know Ashley in real life. What do the kids say? IRL? You got kids. They say IRL. IRL. I don't know. There's probably something different than that these days. I can't keep up with it. But yes. <laughs> So, and that's so fun. I, I'm having more and more people come on my channel that I actually do know in real life. And that is so freaking fun to do because on this channel, we believe and follow the Ram Dass quote. Uh, we're all just walking each other home. We're all just doing this together. But Ashley, you started off as an attorney here in Atlanta. And as we were talking off about off camera, guys, we're going to do more episodes based on some stuff that Ashley has experienced in her attorney life. But she kind of started a whole new life for yourself. And you, while doing this, you started a podcast. And I'm just going to read you guys the quick description of Ashley's podcast. Because I think for a lot of my viewers and friends watching right now, a lot of people, whether they wanted to or not, had to start over in these last few years. And so, um, and I know Ashley, like I said, guys, I know in real life, she's got a great sense of humor. And so I'm going to read you the description of her podcast. And of course, all those links will be down in the description box below. But Ashley says, we have permission to begin again. We are meant to thrive, to live life out loud, to seek joy and abundance. We get to hit the reset and take risks to build a new life we love. Sounds great in theory, but the question is how? A big firm lawyer for 20 years, Ashley walked out of her corner office in the city trading high heels for flip-flops and burnout for big dreams, seeking a kick-ass life. Sounds idyllic, right? Yeah, about that. Literally nothing went as planned. Come along for the journey as Ashley interviews dream seekers, everyday people doing extraordinary things, and shares her own thoughts about seeking joy at the intersection of business and life. Curiosity and conversation lead to beautiful moments. If you want someone to walk beside you, someone who really doesn't have it all figured out, the Kick Ash Life podcast is for you. And I'm telling you guys, Ashley herself is hysterical. And I have, I, you are one of my favorite people at the Shala. And so I'm so excited to start listening to your podcast as well, because I know you, you are such a sincere human being and you, you do look at life from such a comical perspective sometimes. And I think that's what we need. So how are you doing this morning, Ashley? How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm so, I'm here with you. So life is good because we need each other. We need connection. We need community. And even if it's on the Zoom, I, we're together. And I'm so grateful. I'm grateful to have you too, Ashley. And um, so let's get started. Let's. I, I want it. We were chatting about because Ashley is the proud weirdo look out like all of us. <laughs> she's a little she's, well, and, and the uh, the etymology of the word weird means liberated. So, um, so Ashley, I, I always say, yeah, I'm a weirdo. I'm liberated. And Ashley, you've had a lot of like paranormal experiences, which we can get into because there's one common denominator that Ashley and I um, and my boyfriend have with the paranormal. But we'll get into that soon. But Ashley, like, what inspired you? What what when you decided to leave? I, didn't, I was going to say corporate America, law America, the big city of Atlanta, Georgia, which is the New York of the South, where Empire State South, you were this big attorney. What was that breaking point for you where you're like, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. You know, it was a combination. So some of it was practical life. I went through a crazy divorce. It was brutal. It was ugly. And I was based in Atlanta, but most of my work was in D.C., in corporate life in a, in a large law firm. And I was on a plane every week back and forth to DC, which I loved, which I loved the drama. I loved the travel. I loved the 6 a.m. Monday morning flights. Like I, I loved all of that. I'm, I'm weird that way because it always felt like an adventure. You know, I was always going to get to go somewhere and do something fun. But as a single mom, that just wasn't going to work anymore. And so there was that. And then also I ran into a friend the other day from years back and she said, well, somebody from the firm just told me that you had a, um, a personality difference and you're damn right. 
we had a difference in personalities. It was no longer aligned for me. We just, I couldn't live in that world anymore. Like it made me physically, I, I couldn't do it. And so I walked, I walked. Yeah. So what made you go and walking? I'm going to start a podcast. Okay, the podcast came later. So the podcast and also blog called to me much earlier, but I fought it and I just, just yeah, 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 I need to go earn. I need to go do things that, you know, and finally I, I sort of surrendered. I surrendered because I, I had, I was waking up at three in the morning and words would just come to me and I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. And I just had stories that needed to be shared. Maybe you know this, right? Like you just, it just had to come out. It had to go somewhere. So I finally just gave in and started a podcast and then later started a blog, which is slightly different from the podcast, but literally the words just were coming and they had to go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, do you think, I know, um, Ashley, we were talking offline about this and I know my, my, my audience is very, very familiar with the law of one because we spoken about it a lot on this channel. Do you feel like that there's no uh, coincidence that all this happened at the time that the world was kind of going through upheaval as well? Uh, there can't be a coincidence. It, the, the only struggle is that I tried to ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's hard, right? Like my yeah. friend Tamara down in Australia, she always talks about listening to your gut. And the problem is, is that we've been so disconnected from our gut because we've been taught to, taught to think logically. And um, logically in, in America, you are most countries, you get an education, you get your good job, you have a 401k, you know, it, it's not about following your dreams. It's not about necessarily being happy. You know, it's about doing the grind. And when you, when it gets to the point, like you said, where you're so out of alignment that you're physically getting sick, you're physically feeling that something has to change and it's like the universe is literally pushing you on more of a dharmic path than anything like what you came here to do and um and so what's the biggest thing that you learned ashley from like taking this leap of faith what's the biggest lesson you've learned in all this just to listen so so here's how it all kind of went down i bought a place down at the beach like a little fixer upper and I was on a conference call for work and it was one of these bombastic chest thumping. I know everything type of lawyer calls because you talk about logic, add lawyer training on top of that. Right. <laughs> like there's, there's a lot. And I just took a notepad and I went down to the beach and I just sat there with it and without any intention of my own whatsoever on the page appears exit strategy. And I just start, and words always have come to me, exit strategy. And I just started writing about what that would look like. And I don't know what I've learned from the whole thing is just to lean in because I resisted it. I, I wrote the exit strategy and then I bought the exit strategy for a couple of years. But in just starting, there's a release, there's a freedom, there's a creative outlet that I think each of us has inside of us. It's meant to come out. It's meant to be shared. Stories are meant to be shared on the podcast. I interview people who aren't doing life perfectly, but they have stories and in the stories they're healing. And yeah, I just lean in sooner than I did. Yeah. It's so funny. It's like sometimes uh, I've, sp I've spoken about this with my friend Jay from spiritually raw before on this channel, you know, sometimes life pushes you to the point where you have no choice, but to lean in. And the funny thing is, is like when you take those, that, that gamble, when you do something that wasn't in your, your plans to do and you just go with it, the journey of that experience, there's so many wonderful little nuggets of experiences that you, you would have never lived if you didn't take that chance. And I know people get very, very stressed about the finances. They get very stressed about not having the security that they had with the, the lawyer job or the corporate job or whatever it is. But, you know, my boyfriend, which Ashley knows, um, is very, very big and being like, but the universe always does provide. It always works out. Everything always ends up working out. You just have to trust. And sometimes I think that um, when we're used to having security 
as far as like finances or a job, we don't even have an opportunity to realize where we're not trusting, right? It's only when you're pushed to the edge that you realize where your your lack of trust lies. Um, it's like Sri Swami Satyananda says in his commentary of the Yoga Sutra. It's like any time, because I struggle with anxiety, anytime anxiety comes up, that's a way for you to realize where you're not trusting God. You feel like you're out there by yourself. And then when you start to see it in that perspective and the bigger picture of yourself as a soul, not just as a being, but as a soul, it's a beautiful experience because if you're living a, a, I hate using that word privileged. I feel like that word's been overused these last few years. I don't think anybody is really privileged in this world. We all have our own crosses yeah. to bear. But financially, if you come from like a privileged background financially and you've never known that struggle, you've never known what that's like, then I don't think you have that opera, that rare opportunity to really lean on divinity and lean on God or whatever consciousness, whatever you call that, you know? And so what, what has that taught you, um, Ash, from like going from this standard scheduled life to now being kind of on your own? Like I was about to say free balling for the people that it's kind of, <laughs> kind of just free balling. You're just free. You're out there. <laughs> Oh, I think you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, the dogs are barking. I'm oh, sorry. that's okay. Robbie barks all the time, too. It's fine. okay. Don't worry Apollo is a great Pyrenees, and he's guarding his sheep very carefully. It's a thing. Um, yeah. So I grew up with not a lot of financial security. Both my parents were school teachers. And so I was used to just, you know, but I was living their dream as a lawyer. And I will tell you that in the last year, there's been a lot of financial insecurity and I've had to lean into faith and um, okay. I'm going to tell you a funny story, but first I'll say there's that. So I grew up in the Southern Baptist tradition. Um, I'm a recovering Southern Baptist. So I can quote you scripture all day long, <laughs> all day, honey. And sometimes I do go back to scripture for comfort because that's what I know. And there's a, a verse, I can't remember the exact book and page, but it's, you know, um, I, I have plans to prosper you, for I know the plans I have for you. There are plans to prosper you and to harm you. And I've taken a lot of strength from that. And there's been a lot of empathy in that, a lot of growth, a lot of expansion, and a lot of faith. A lot of faith because I had rejected the church, but I never moved back into faith and hope. I've always been in love. Love's been easy. Love is easy. Faith and hope for me are a whole different ball game. And so I've had to move back into that. And I am grateful for the experience. And it is hurt like hell. But man, I wouldn't trade it. No. Yeah. It's, it's, um, when you go through these trials and tribulations, sometimes too, it's like they say it's going to make or break you. And I think the thing too, what's amazing, Ashley, because I know obviously off camera you have before all this happened, you were working on yourself, you were already starting that journey. Um, and you can definitely see with you, especially that, that, that when you've taken the time to actually heal yourself and work on yourself, when these obstacles come up, they still come up. It's not like they're not going to come up. You're able to process them in a very different way and and observe tragedy and observe that friction um in a very different way in a very human way versus having a complete panic you know and a complete meltdown you're able to feel that panic feel that oh shit oh shit oh shit but still know that there that this too is going to pass and that that there is a purpose in all of this and i remember long a long time ago i used to go to this like Sunday service. It was like a weirdo. Sun. It was like a bunch of people who were spiritual, but not religious. And yeah. um, I remember this one person talking about how when, you know, in the United States and the, we drive on the right side of the road. So when you make a left turn, you have to stop. You have to come to complete stop before you make your left turn to make sure there's no traffic. And this person was saying, you know, it's kind of like in life when, when things are changing for you, when your life is changing directions, you have to stop for a minute and you got to let, you know, before you make that turn, like that left turn, you know, and sometimes in that stop where everything just kind of like collides and money becomes weird or you change jobs and there's that, that 
pause because things are about to change directions. And sometimes certain things have to be kind of taken away from you in order for you not to rely on that old crutch when you're going into a new beginning. And I think that a lot of people, I know that people watching right now have been, can probably relate to that because so many people lost their jobs. So many with, with the, with this stellar economy we have going on right now, um, people are really, I mean, it's a, it's, I mean, we, we do pretty well, but it's still like going to the grocery store. Every time we go to the grocery store, we both come back and we're like, what the fuck? Like what the actual fuck is this? Like, it's unbelievable how, and that's out of your control. It's not, it's, 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 you know, yes, it's in our control on the extent of like what we vote for and what we do with the fraud that's been given to us. But, but in, in, in that moment, there's not a whole lot that you can do. And, you know, my boyfriend who is, is, as Ashley knows him, he's a very sweet person, very kind person. Um, and um, he always says, you know, the, the, the lower they go, the, the lower the bad guys in your life go. So whether that's the government or whether that's a narcissistic ex, the higher you get to go, the more you get to be a helping hand to somebody else. And that's the opportunity that 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 this is providing us, you know, is like the the more abuse we take from our powers that be. What a wonderful opportunity we now have to help each other out and to move forward together and and to say i understand i know what you're going through i i get it you know um um it's the illusion that we've all the, the maya as they say in San, San, the illusion is crumbling at this m moment there's no hiding anything about our lives now because we can't it is do or die at this point and so um and i just i just think it's amazing ashley that you've 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 handled this like boomerang in your life this like change with such grace in a sense of humor, you know, um, how are your kids handling you having a different job and not being the same schedule that you were on before? Oh, it's not good at all. You know, to the grocery store point, let's start there. What an opportunity is last week I was at the grocery store with my daughter and it was an opportunity to explain to her, like we are having to watch what we're spending, but can you imagine what this is for people right now? Like, let's have a moment of prayer and empathy and compassion and concern for so many people that can't afford a head of broccoli right now. That's insane. Yeah. And very concerning and also probably part of the bigger structure that we're fighting against that means we are, aren't eating clean foods and good foods and all of that. But I could go down that rabbit trail all day long. Oh, we will. We are going to come back, Ashley, because you got a lot of stuff to say. We will. We'll be doing those episodes on a rumble. But yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for my kids, you know, I think in the moment, it's been tough to say we used to be able to do all these things and we're not doing these things. But it's been good, too. There's been appreciation. There's been lessons that they might not have ever learned and so i'm grateful for that as as tough as it's been also my daughter is is a very um naturally corporate personality my son's an artist so he's like let's go let's be a musician let's be theater let's do all this but my daughter's like i think i may want to be an hr consultant you know so <laughs> she right um it that has been hard for her to say mom i miss the days that you got your hair done and you put on a dress and you went to the office and I hung out under your desk in the corner office on the 40th floor. Like those were good days. I liked seeing my mom empowered like that. And so learning how to see one another empowered in a different way. I was about to say, but you're even more empowered now because you're in your sovereignty. It's a journey. It's a journey. And if we, gosh, it's a hard journey, but if we don't take it, what generational things are we handing down? You know, the thing is to all oh, look at that. The thing is too, I, 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 you know, I think for kids as well, I just know from my experience, I, you know, I've shared on my channel, I, we're talking about the medical world and I grew up with a bunch of doctors in my family. And for a very long time, I was very, I, whenever I'd have to go to the hospital for whatever reason, whether I was picking someone up or going there myself, I loved it. I loved being at the hospital. I felt so comfortable there. I felt so safe there. And it was because that was my family. And over, over this 2020 disaster, I started to question that a lot. And so it could be too for children that they're 
they're correlating not just the job, but like that was her comfort, you know? And so, I, I mean, these kids today that are being born are so freaking special and already like way more attuned than we were as kids. But, um, but yeah, and, and it might be, you know, some, some people just like the organization of having a corporate job or being that knowing what they're doing at eight o'clock in the morning, Monday through Friday, you know, like that's, that's definitely a personality type. And so, but what an, an, an unique experience for her, especially to see both sides of you as a woman you know and you, uh, let me say this okay if you choose the corporate eight to five that's okay too I think we need that in our world as it currently exists and some folks are truly built for that and that's okay yeah but there's a beauty there because there's a certainty to being able to say this is what I'm going to do I'm going to bookend this and then at the end of this i'm free to do whatever am i allowed to curse oh yeah that's fine yeah curse right. i'm free yeah. to do whatever the fuck i want to after this because of this security so it, it plays out different for different folks yeah but at the end of the day what we, what i think a lot of people watching will relate to you on ash is that nagging that nagging and i've had those jobs before like before i went off to india ran off to india I had those jobs where I was so depressed Monday through Friday. I hated the job when I lived out in Los Angeles. Like I hated it. I hated it so much. I, my, my mood and depression would change on the weekends. And then I would go back to being completely a mess during the week. I would watch the clock. I was just so miserable in my life. So I know that feeling I got good paychecks for that misery, but it's no way to live. And some people are that, that feel that are watching right now, I, I guess. I mean, I love how you said like permission to begin again, like to give yourself. I think a lot of people feel like they don't have that permission to start again. And I hope for people watching, if you take anything away from, from this, you're the grantor of that permission, you know, and just because you don't know where, st what starting again maybe looks like, create that exit strategy that you know will help free you because i can guarantee you having a mom or a dad or a, a parent or a spouse that's happier in life is way better than having a miserable partner spouse parent that's miserable but rich you know i heard on a podcast i'm a podcast junkie by the way it's a whole thing but i heard on the podcast years ago what's the worst thing that could happen sit down and write it out. What is the absolute worst thing that could happen? Is it, I end up living in my car? What, what is that? And then, okay, let's say I end up living in my car, which blessedly didn't happen. Like, okay, how do you get out of that? You're a resourceful human being. Figure out the worst and know that that's unlikely to be the thing. And then figure out the best and orchestrate toward that. I build your joy along the way. I love that. And I, I have this like fear. I've had this fear since I was a little kid about being homeless. And I don't know why, because that, that's never been it's probably a past life thing. Um, and I have those fears a lot. And I, I have to sit there and think about, okay, well, what if we lost our house? Like, what if AYA went down business wise? Like, what if something happened? And I have to remind myself, you're right. There are the worst case scenario probably would never happen. Why? Because me, like everybody watching right now has friends and family that would always step in if something was going awry, you know? And so you're right. Sit down and think about the worst case scenario and then backpedal from that a little bit because it's, it's, um, and, and therapy, my therapist would call it catastrophe thinking, which is a real thing. You guys catastrophe thinking, and so if you find yourself going to that place, like if you think, oh my God, I wish I could do what Ashley did. I wish I could just like, that just sounds amazing, but I'm terrified. Like if I leave my job the next week, I'm going to be homeless. Like is the likelihood of that, is that an actual like, or is that catastrophe thinking? And when, now that I know that's a thing, I can catch myself when I start to catastrophe think I can catch myself and be like, that's not likely to happen. Like that's, you're good. Like, and my 40 years on this planet, no matter how bad things got, God always provide, like there were, the universe always stepped in and made sure I was okay. And so I hope that people hear that and know that it's okay to be afraid. Like that, that happens. That's just, but as they say, what's the acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. 
every time. Every time you learn to trust yourself. Like, you are resourceful. You're amazing. You are full of love and light and joy and health and wealth. And all of those things are right there. But it's a faith exercise. Yeah, it, absolutely. And I did a great episode with Jay. We talked about this a little bit too. Like people, my friend Jay from Spiritually Raw, we we talked about like, you know, you talk about, you know, your podcast is your hobby or YouTube was my hobby. What Whatever you like to do, keep doing it because eventually you're going to get sponsorships. Eventually you're going to get ad revenue. Eventually you're going, that's going to grow into something that's going to then provide for you that financial um, necessity that the job you hated did. So keep, don't lose yourself in that misery. Um, because you're right, uh, Ashley, we are, we are sparks of light and therefore we are creators. That's what we came here to do is to create. We are fractals of God. You know, when, when, the, when the sperm hits the egg, a spark of light happens in that moment. That's you. That's you're that spark of light. You didn't come here to be miserable. You didn't come here to sit in a cubicle if that's not what you want to do and stare at a computer screen all day. You didn't come here to be a slave to a boss that you don't like, you know? Um, and so you have that power, that spark of light to course correct all of that, you know? And it's because, you know, misery that now you understand joy. So see that as an exercise of understanding misery so that you can experience what joy actually is. Um, King, only in darkness can we see the stars. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The Emerald Tablets say, a thought says in the Emerald Tablets, we only know life because we know death. It's the only reason why we know when we're in soul form, when we don't have a mortal body we're living in, we're just in our soul. We don't do anything because we don't know life because there's no death with the soul. So we have to come into this crazy, hectic planet to actually experience that friction to feel that to experience the misery so that we know the joy to to have that understanding of death so that we can really live life that's why we came here so yeah absolutely well speaking of spirituality and guys we're going to talk about uh, some ghost stories but before we do that i just want to take a moment to say a quick thank you to our sponsors asia so hold tight for one moment as there's a, a brief message from asia my uncle Dan used to talk about QTR. QTR meant for him quality time remaining. My uncle Dan was a very active cyclist and a very avid hiker. And after he retired, after a long career, he decided that he really wanted to make the most of the years he had left where there was quality to his life before the aging process really limited his ability to enjoy things like cycling and hiking. Unfortunately, my Uncle Dan did lose his battle to cancer back in 2019, but when I was first introduced to the ASEA product, all I kept thinking about was my Uncle Dan and his concoction post-retirement of quality time remaining. As human beings, we've been taught that as our body starts to age, we eventually have to start giving up some of the activities that we enjoyed. For my uncle, that was cycling and hiking. With the ASEA supplement, what this product does is it restores signaling back into the body. Signaling, our communication between the cells of the body, is what actually allows the aging process to happen. Your body is designed by nature, by God, whatever you want to call that higher consciousness, it's designed to heal itself. That's why the cells communicate. That's why you have an immune system. But unfortunately, as we become conditioned to the toxins of this world, that immune system and that signaling system start to wear down. When our body loses signaling, that's what causes wrinkles. That's what causes cellulite. That's what causes the hair to gray. And for men, 
That's potentially what causes hair loss. As Dr. Silverman has used as an example, when we are a child and we fall off of our bicycle and skin our knees, our recovery time is pretty quick. This is because we have an abundance of redox or signaling in our bodies. But after puberty and into our adulthood, we rapidly start to lose this signaling. So if we were to fall off a bike at 80, that could mean life or death. Now for me, since I've been on the SIA now for about three months, I have noticed a tremendous amount of energy and endurance restored back to my life. As you guys all know, I am an avid exerciser. I truly believe in the power of a good sweat. And since starting the ASEA, I have noticed that my recovery time between workouts and my endurance within workouts has enhanced immensely. I'm able to go longer and harder. I've also noticed, as many of you guys have commented in the comment section, I feel like I'm getting younger or at least looking younger. No, my age keeps going up, but I look back and compare my videos now to the videos I did when I first started YouTube and I feel like I look younger now than I did then. And I do have to say that is most likely because of the ASEA. When I talked to my mother about this product, I mentioned the quality time remaining that my uncle Dan used to speak of and how with the ASEA for her as a grandmother, this product can give her her the potential to have a lot longer quality time of playing in the backyard with her grandchildren. In fact, so many amazing, incredible stories can be found in comment sections of this video and on Asiya's own YouTube channel, which I will place down in the description box below. Now, we can't make any medical claims with this product as it is just a supplement. But from my perspective and from all of the um, perspectives and experiences I've read from you guys, this product has done nothing but enhance every single person's life every single person's quality time remaining, whether that be 50 years or 10 years. We see a lot of people talk about med beds, this idea of med beds. Everybody's waiting for a med bed, but what if I told you, in my opinion, the med bed is already here. With the ASEA, what it comes with, each liquid, it's a liquid, each liquid comes with its own shot glass. The shot glass is about two ounces. Each person is instructed to take between four and eight ounces a day. You take a little shot of the ASEA, you swish it around for 30 to 60 seconds so that you allow the saliva to carry the redox where it wants to carry it, and then you swallow the rest. The redox is so genius, and the creators of this product are so genius that in my opinion they really really honored and respected god's design because you see when you take the liquid redox you are allowing your body its own intelligence because the redox is just a tool it's just the signaling for your cells your cells your body is designed to heal itself and this is what helps the body to continue to heal itself and so when you take the liquid your body knows exactly where it needs to send the redox, what part of your body is wounded, what part of your body isn't so stable. And so it sends the redox to that particular area so the cells in that area can start to communicate to get that particular area of the body back to where it needs to be. Now, of course, with this redox gel, you are able to direct the gel wherever you want it to go. So today I woke up and had a little bit of a creak in my neck. So I took the redox gel and I rubbed it on the back of my neck three times within five minutes. I personally, in my experience, automatically started to feel relief. You can also use this as a beauty supplement too. I've been using the gel on my thighs and on my boobs because yes friends i am 40 years old and as as the aging process does occur the body starts to droop a little bit and no i've never had children so my boobs aren't as droopy as they could be if i had to use them to feed a child but they still are you know i got boobs and they 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 they're, they're starting to sink a little bit. I also have stretch marks on my boobs that I've had my whole life because, you know, they grew. 
at some point when I was a child. So I've been taking the gel and putting them on my chest. And not only have I noticed a difference, but my boyfriend has also noticed a different difference as well. My boyfriend has been putting the gel on his head. As he is in his 50s now, he has started to notice thinning of the hair, as most men do around that age in their lives. And he is starting to grow his hair back which is quite incredible. In fact, I find myself now when I walk past him putting my hand in his hair just to feel all the hair that's growing back on his head. You see, my friends, your body doesn't want to fail you. It wants to keep you going. It wants to keep you healthy. That is how God designed it. And this product is basically the controllers of this world's worst nightmare. Now, once again, I can't make any medical claims because this product is just a supplement. But from everything I have researched about this product, from all of the people using this product, you really can't go wrong with this product. And because this product uses the intelligence of your body, each individual person is going to start to notice different things occurring with this product. If you are interested in learning more about this product or purchasing this product, product or even becoming a part of the business of ASEA, please text Bryce Info to 321-216-8047. Again, that's Bryce Info to 321-216-8047 and Jay or Hillis will get back to you as soon as possible. If you are texting from a country outside of the United States, please make sure that you add plus one. 321-216-8047 plus one is our country code. And in your text, on top of texting Bryce info, just make sure you let Jay or Hillis know that you are texting from a country outside of the United States so they can arrange a call with you on WhatsApp or Signal or Zoom, any application that's not gonna charge you. With that being said, another amazing thing about the SEA company is that they do offer a 30 day money back guarantee. So if this product doesn't work for you or isn't what you expected after the first 30 days, they will refund you. All right, back to our show. All right, you guys, thanks for sitting. I, I love my Asiya. I was t- actually telling Ashley about Asiya offline because she was like, your hair's gotten so long. I was like, it's Asiya. <laughs> it's a supplement. <laughs> so, and we love our Asiya. Asiya is what allows me to do these podcasts, these episodes on YouTube completely for free um, because they pay for you guys to be able to watch this completely for free. So we love our Asiya so much. So anyway, let's talk about some juicy ghost stories. Shouldn't we, yeah. Ashley? we So I think I've said this on the channel before. I don't know. I I forget what I say online and what I say offline. Um, Ashtanga Yoga Atlanta, which is AYA, it's our shala. Um, Yeah, it's it's a very sacred place um, where Ashley met met me, or I met Ashley. It is in an area of Atlanta called Inman Park. Inman Park is um, a very old area of Atlanta. Uh, it's near Oakland Cemetery, which I've covered on this channel. It's it's there's a lot of um, Civil War markers around this area, and the building where AYA is located is notoriously haunted. And um, we had before a long time when I first started teaching there, I would be there like by myself at dark thirty in the morning back in the office and I would hear boots walking around in the main room and I would go out to see if a student was there and there would be nobody there. Or I would walk in. I don't even know if I've told you this, Ashley, I would walk in when I used to teach lead on Friday and sometimes the door would be wide open, which Todd would get mad at me and be like, don't go in there. If it's open, I'm like, what are people stealing? It's a yoga shawl. There's nothing in here. It's an empty room. Uh, but I would go in and like the, the, the two faucets in the bathroom, we have two bathrooms, the faucets would be on full blast. And then there would be, there's a, there's a sink in the back office and that faucet would be on full blast too. Like whoever left, we, we rent space out during the night and the, the day. So whoever left would have heard this, would have heard all the sinks on. So there, nobody turned them on. And so for a long time, when I first started teaching there, I didn't say anything to Todd, like about what I was hearing. Cause I didn't want to come across as like a weirdo. But one day I just like asked him, I was like, is this place haunted? And he goes, oh yeah, it's totally haunted. I was like, we well, probably should have told me that before, <laughs> before I started Heads up about the ghosts, please. Thought, yeah. thought I was crazy for a moment there. Um, and anyway, so yeah, there's all these businesses around. There's like a school preschool on the other side, and they've said that they've come in and their toys have been thrown around the room. Um, the it's an Italian restaurant now, but it used to be like a 
like, like a tea room. Latino, rest, like a Latin restaurant. Or well, they had a big Buddha in there that apparently took many men like to move. It's a huge statue. And they would come in the morning and the statue would be on the other side of the room. So all it's the land that's haunted, basically, is what I'm saying. It's not just AYA. It's the whole building that's actually haunted. Now, with that being said, I nev- have you ever felt threatened at AYA, Ashley? Like, ever felt? And I've never felt threatened. There have been mornings that I've coming in that I've sensed mm-hmm. presences, and I've had to pray over it, but I've never felt unsafe it's just a an awareness yeah and i don't know if you remember when i would teach so usually with a with ashtanga we 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 teach in a style called mysore which is what most days are where it's we open at like 5 30 we close at 8 the student comes in at any point and works privately with the teacher so students are coming and going it's an incredible way to practice but on fridays we do a lead a lead class it's the only lead class and we play no music in traditional you know it's just a count ache and inhale do exhale i keep it we keep it kind of like um um oh for music what's that thing called that keeps the beat anyway oh the metronome metronome Metronome. yeah yeah we we, we try to keep it on like a metronome to keep people it's like a collective meditation so i would be teaching lead and basically i would stand or sit at the back of the room and i would count and i the the door would be shut to the lobby and many times during lead i don't know if you ever noticed this ashley if i get up and like go open the door and look in the lobby because i would think a student came in late and i was going to open the door and tell them just to come on and it's fine but there would be nobody there or i would see a body walk across through the through the curtains and there would be nobody there and i'd be like oh it's i called him tom because we figured that this was a a ghost from the civil war that had obviously died during the civil war and just because the, the feeling that you got it, the boots, it was just a very Civil War-esque feeling. Well, this one day, t- Todd used to teach these Sunday morning um, chanting, Vedic chanting classes that people would come before the practice. And he's an incredible Sanskrit guy. He's an incredible chanter. And so and he really loves doing these classes. And he texted me, and I teach at a separate place on Sundays. He texted me, and he was like, oh, my God, I saw Tom. He was like, we were sitting around doing the chanting, and he goes, I noticed that Ashley looked like she was about to pass out. And I noticed that Tom was sitting beside her, basically feeding off of Ashley's energy in order to appear. And I as we were catching up before we started feeling I, I, t- I was like Ashley I don't know if you know this story and you were like so go ahead go ahead Ashley you take it from there well so I remember it was it was holiday time and so there was um, a party at the Shala it was right after this had happened and I remember sort of going like out of my body and you guys told me about it at the party that there was this entity sitting next to me and I kind of freaked out and I can I talked with um an intuitive about it and she was like no that would be possession if that came out of your body right she's like that may have been your guide I have well two- I'm gonna I'm gonna stop right there because it's not yeah. possession and yeah, that's not no been. so yeah it's so yeah. and that, that happens to me a lot that happens to uh-huh. me a lot so when you are a high vibrational person um, meaning that because I've seen spirits my whole life and, yeah. and I didn't know what this was. I would go places and I would start to feel very drained of energy, like where I've had a really hard time, like focusing, you're being fed off of. Mm-hmm. So there are light beings and there are light eaters. Now, sometimes like my friend Cindy, who does. So possession is completely different, you guys. So possession, um, when you get possessed by a spirit, you have to actually ask the spirit to come into you. So possessions don't just happen accidentally. You have to actually invite them in. So I hope that like dissipates any fear people have. But what happens is, and sometimes, which this case with Tom, I don't think he was trying to hurt Ashley. I think he just, when you have like disembodied, like dead dudes, basically like dead, dead people spirits, not like angels or demons, but like people who are like disembodied and they're confused or we can get into that more. Um, they, they see somebody like Ashley or like myself who, who, who has a certain light or a certain, and they cling to you because you then are able to potentially communicate with them. And so they're using that your energy in order to, for you to see them. 
And it's not that they're doing it again intentionally, unless it's like a demon. Um, with black magic, what I've learned is that demons won't come to you unless you summon them or somebody sends them to you, right? So again, you can't just walk around somewhere and all of a sudden a demon's attached to you. That's not how that works, right? So um, yeah, they have to, you have to be, and the reason why, if you go back biblically, um, demons are what fallen angels, well, what they neglect to tell us at Vacation Bible School is that these demons didn't fall by choice. They were kidnapped, basically. They were kidnapped. And so they're chained. They're chained to Lucifer, and then they're chained to witches and warlocks who use black magic, and then they get chained to the person that is is the spells being sent to. So they don't want to be there like you don't. Like It's, it's a very non-consensual thing, right? So demons are not going to hurt you unless they're being forced to by somebody else or you invite them, invite them in yourself. But with disembodied dead dudes, it's an, they're, they don't know that's what they're doing. And so that's what I think. I think he saw, Ashley, that you are a beacon of light. And he, because go ahead, go finish the story because there's a reason you, 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 you yeah, told me the story. We'll get there. So in, in my mind at the time, I rationalized it as one of my spirit guides just wanted to sit with us because it's such a beautiful, intense, positive energy that I just thought, oh, this is my spirit guide and he, one of them. And he, and he wants to be here because it's beautiful. Um, and I kind of wrote it off, right? Because but it, it wasn't a harmful, it didn't hurt. It wasn't, you know, it was gentle, but it was also intense. Um, and so a couple of years later, when I was just really struggling, I, I reached out to you and I said, dude, the energy is not right. I feel like I'm just being held down. Right. And, and I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. And there was a lot going on that we won't get into, but one of the things that you suggested to me was this hypnosis mm -hmm. therapy. And so I went into this like light hypnosis and the process was to identify energies that might have been attached and to help them release and to go into the light. And there were several and, and it was, it was intense. I'm still processing it. But one of the energies that came up in the second session was perhaps Tom. Because I had this whole, I'm going to sound like a complete nut, but whatever. No, we, oh, listen, girl, you're, this is the weirdo channel. <laughs> I'm, I'm you know, um, I'm going to trust that, you know, whoever's listening and just received the, the love that it is shared with. But um, in my hypnotic state, a Confederate soldier came to me and said, in a very Southern accent, half drunk, I, we just trying to get out of here. <laughs> and I said, well, all right, honey, let's, let's go. Like, let's go into the light. Let's, let's find, let, I'm going to pray that you find your way. And he says, can I bring my buddies with me? I was like, yeah, go get your buddies. Like, let's just pray you into the light. And, and they start whooping and hollering and whiskey toasting and running. Okay. And then the lead guy, I guess he's Tom, comes back and says, that's not everybody. And I said, well, go ask them if they want to go too. And he came back a little bit discouraged and he said, I, they, they don't want to go. And I said, well, we got a lot of, you know, you got you and your buddies, are you good? And he's like, hell yeah. And he was like, it was like a party. And I just remember saying, oh, you Southern boys. And they were gone and there was a peace. That makes me, well, and that's, that's, um, so, and I told you, Ashley, I said, I, since I, I, I don't go to the shawl that much anymore. Um, there's a, a reason why I don't go that much anymore. We had some people kind of show up at the shala that, yeah. So, um, anyway, but I hear that the activity in the shala is, is very quiet now. And so I, it's going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to go tell Todd after this, the story you just told me, because we were trying to figure out why it was so quiet. And I knew, you know, we, we all knew that Tom, as I called him, was an intelligent haunting. Like he knew he was dead. 
Um, there was one morning I, he was being really, really, really loud. And it was before lead class, like so loud that I was pretty certain he was going to materialize. And I've seen spirits before, but it's still a lot actually, but it still can be kind of shocking when you see it. And so I said, I remember sitting in the back office and I said out loud by myself at like five o'clock in the morning, I was like, listen, I hear that you're here. I, I reckon, I, I honor that you're here in this space, but I have to teach soon. And I'm a lady. And if you materialize, there is a chance I could shit my pants. And I don't have another pair of pants to change into. So I'm a lady. And I don't want and, and it stopped at that moment when I kind of expressed that I was getting a little uncomfortable, it completely stopped. And so I, I, I have known that he was an intelligent haunting. But and you could tell like, you know, when we talk about people like at AYA at, at, at Ashtanga, you know, Traditional yoga, Ashtanga being one of one of the lineages, is very can be very demanding. It's it's you you don't just go to Ashtanga just for shits and giggles, right? You you don't. It's an early morning practice. It's going to kick your ass. It's going to bring you to your knees. It's going to make you cry. It's really only sustainable practice for people who really want to do the work, who are really interested in in healing themselves and and getting out of their own way. Um, and so, with that being said most of the students in that space are people like Ashley who are questioning life, who have a higher vibration that wants something that's real. They don't want to go to like a fake yoga class. They want to go to a real, real yoga class, a real lineage. They want a real teacher. And so you have a lot of very sincere people in there that are of the light themselves. And so it makes sense that someone like Tom and his, if he was the ringleader for his buddies, were trying to get the fuck out of here. Like, I would have been like, boo, same, like, take me with you, <laughs> like, same, um, you know, that, that they, that, that they would have, have clinged to students at AYA to help them because they, they saw a kindred spirit. They saw somebody that, that was trying to, to find that, that alignment with the light, with that, with God. And, um, that makes me feel better that he's now moved on. That would suck to be stuck in a disembodied state for like 150 years. Can you imagine you met, and can you imagine the party on the other side? I know. Well, the fact they were drinking whiskey makes me feel a whole lot better because if I got stuck disembodied, I want to at least know that there's some whiskey to be drunk. There's some whiskey. It was such a party on their way out. And like, I have such a visual of these guys leaving and it was joy. There was so much joy and I do like the party. So. Yeah, I know. Same. We're Southerners. Listen. <laughs> we'll get drunk on a Saturday night and be at church on Sunday morning. That's how it works out here on, in the South. Amen. Amen. We, we, we <laughs> like our, our alcohol down here. We like it. We like it a lot. Um, so is that, so, so Ashley, have you had other, like your whole life, have you just been attracted to the spirit or have spirits been attracted to you? Um, I don't know that I would say it that way. Um, I, I have experiences. So, so I, I think, I'm still learning, but I think I'm clear audience. And so I hear yeah. things um, and sometimes words just come to me. So one of the reasons I started the blog is because words were just coming through me and I would wake up at 3 a.m. and I would hear like I just did a blog post called Write the Pain because the the noise in my head was write the pain, write the pain, write the pain. I was like, damn it, do I have to do this right now? Like, it's 10 o'clock at night, I'm ready to go to bed. And they were like, well, it's 10 a.m. or 3 a.m., you choose. So I just start writing, and sometimes the words I feel like aren't necessarily of me, but through me. So mine has always been words, always, always. Yeah. Have you ever done automatic writing? Yeah. Have you ever tried that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm more Claire. Um, I, I see. I'm more clairvoyant. I see. Um, is that clairvoyancy? I see. I, see. I hear with um, Magdalene. I hear Magdalene, but I see and I get messages from what I see. Um, that's kind of what, what, but yeah, mine started when I was, uh, my, when my mother was in labor with me, I had in, my heart kind of stopped. And so I think that's where it started. So I don't know life without being able to see, um, an experience and I get attacked a lot. We, we have people know that Ashley knows that she, she's seen the pictures too. So, you know, I think as a child, I, I was very tuned into it because I would hear as a, as a little girl, I would hear, I always feel like the radio is on 
and nobody else is hearing the radio. I'm like, no, 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 the radio is on. There's music. It's happening. It's like something out here. But as you get older, you and particularly if you're in a very traditional setting, you just sort of tune the radio off. Mm-hmm. Right. And then when life starts to shake up for you, the radio starts to tune back on if you're willing to listen. And yeah. I'm still working through it. And recently I was kidding, I was um, at the salon because this doesn't happen naturally. Just saying. <laughs> and, um, I was at the salon and she was washing my hair and I had crazy flashes of purple. Crazy. I never had this before. Maybe you do this because you see things. Crazy. I said, does purple mean something to you? She was, she was like, girl, you have no idea what purple means to me. You know, so I, I think the more we start to tune into it, there's there's that gift there. And that is, um, you know, with the yoga, the third and fourth pada, which, you know, they, they, t- they tell you don't teach the third and fourth pada until a student's been a regular for like 10, 15 years. But it's already that, you know, when you, it's not censored, when you buy the yoga sutras, they're right there. And they talk about these siddhis and siddhis are like, you know, people laughingly call them the yogi powers. Some of them are things like uh, levitation. Um, others, the more basic city is intuition. And these are things, again, that, yes, we were born with. We lose them as we go through the matrix, as we go through. And I, I agree with you. I think it's very intentional that we lose them, um, that that they they kind of make us, especially for women. And we know that the feminine energy for men, too. So men and women both carry both masculine and feminine, feminine energy. Um, but the feminine energy across the board is the intuition. And for women, especially though, who are dominant feminine energy, um, how many times as a woman have you been told you're crazy or, or you must be hormonal, you know, when you're saying something's not right, something's not right. And women have to be dominant in that intuition because they're mothers, right? Even, even women who are not mothers have that, that sixth sense with children sometimes, like that they can pick up on things that maybe men can't pick up on. And that's because they're dominant in the feminine energy. Um, the womb, the the uterus is a is an organ that kind of gives a lot of that power to women, that intuitional power, L- literally like the liver is anger, you know, whatever. But the, the womb, the uterus for women is very, a very powerful organ for um, for this kind of magic that women, you know, it's like when a woman is able to lift a car off of a child out of the blue, you know, that's where that's coming from. And so I think that they have worked very hard they the proverbial they the controllers of the world to disconnect us from that magical side and energy isn't confined energy is timeless and so when you're around somebody even if they're not speaking to you there's almost a telepathic communication happening whether you're aware of it or not you know and so um it's 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 powerful so i absolutely yeah i see colors so colors sometimes represent angels as well so like purple is michael so if you ever see like swirls of purple it can be michael that's around you um so yeah uh it's it's wild and and sometimes actually i think sometimes people don't even realize that they're having a spiritual experience because they're just used to these weird anomalies happening for them and they just think it's them being quirky. They don't realize that it's an actual spiritual experience, like ringing in the ears, that's a spiritual experience. Um, Seeing colors, yeah, just knowing things about people sometimes. Um, I've had that happen before many times where I'll just know something about someone and I'll mention something and they're like, I never told you that. It's like, I, I just knew it, you know, so um my my sister the other day yeah so i was adopted as a baby um and later found my fam my birth family and my sister's name is ashley that's wild which i just did a podcast on the whole meaning of a name and whether we are gifted names in the womb um and, and where all that comes from and i kind of explored all the different spiritual variations of name but um, my sister works with um, the dying. This is what she does. And she was describing to me about a year ago, one of her patients, and she said, I'm really worried about his cogni- cognitive function and, and how to help him. And in my mind, I could see her sitting at a table with a puzzle. I said, did you give him a puzzle? 
did you get him a puzzle? She said, how did you know? I said, sister, I just, I just knew that's what you would do. And so sometimes these things come to us and all I would say is just ask and don't ignore it. Tap into it. Be curious about it. And the spirit world doesn't want to scare you. Like it, it like, like I said, if, when I told Tom, like, don't, they'll stop if it's too much, you know, don't be afraid to say this is too much. Um, I used to do that at church when I was a little kid, like I would hold my pee all throughout Sunday school so I could go pee during big church because big church was so boring. So like I would hold it and we go through the first part was like singing songs and stuff. And then when the preacher would start his preaching, that's when I'd be like, mom, I have to go to the bathroom. And I would like hold my pee just to go. But I'd be sitting in the toilet like a little kid and I'd be like, don't come to me, Jesus. Don't come to me. <laughs> Like, don't show yourself. I don't want to see no angels. You know, like, you know, I'd be like freaking out because I felt so guilty that I had held my pee like all Sunday school just to just to be able to sneak out of big church. But I'm sure Gosh, God was that your instinct. I wonder if that was just your natural instinct not to hear the way that the word was being shared. Probably. I, I, I have questions about the church I went to. It's, um, I've been very, I mean, I, I think that there are a lot of churches out there that are innocent, like they don't realize what they're actually doing. Um, but I have questions about the church I went to. And I will say I, there's like a preacher man at the church I went to that I actually went to high school with. Now he's like worked his way up into like being a, a preacher. And he actually did my grandmother's funeral service. I saw and with you yeah yeah i was it was there i it was pissed me off because he obviously knew nothing about my grandmother and um the whole pitch it was a sales pitch her funeral was a sales pitch because my grandparents were rich and he wanted to he talked a lot about how much money they give into the church and it was very creepy it was very weird it was like you are literally trying to rope in my dad and his sisters to giving her money to the church to you basically um, and I, and I got even more upset because this was a guy I'd grown up with. And I was like, how fucking dare you, you little piece of shit. You knew this woman, you know, us, you grew up with us. How dare you? How dare you? You know, that's how I kind of felt. And every time now that I go to, to like a funeral service, I get cracked up because I'm not, you know, when, when you, when you get used to things, when you, you get used to things, right? Like when you're in church and I remember being at another funeral service for a friend of mine's mom that had passed away and my mother went with me and it was at the church that I had grown up with. And my mother hadn't been there years either. And the old preacher man came to do the service that I had grown up with and he was giving the sermon, the sermon. And both my mom and I started laughing because it was so ridiculous he was like overacting. He was like pretending to cry. It was, and people were sitting there. I'm like, you guys can't see how much bullshit this is. Like he's bullshitting you. He's bullshitting you. Like he's pretend, this is all pretend. And then my friend's dad got up and spoke and that was sincere. And that was like gut wrenching to hear him speak. But I thought, yeah, so I don't know, maybe it was because I never, um, I was saying this, I was on Davy Jackson's channel a couple nights ago talking about the lost books of the Bible. And I said, I think I said it on air, the God that I've always known is not the God they taught us about at church. These are two different beings. The God that I know and I have known since I was a child is extremely loving and merciful and has never been mad at me. It has always welcomed me with open arms. The God I learned about at church is an asshole who wants human blood, who wants blood sacrifices, who wants you to feel like you're going to hell. These are two different beings, entities. Um, the preachers at my church did wear black robes, which we now know that that is, means they've been swor sworn into the cult of Satan when they wear a black robe. Um, thank you, Jordan Maxwell, for that information. Um, you know, so there, there's some questions I have. I have a lot of, and I actually would love to sit down and talk to the guy I went to school with that did my grandmother's funeral. And just, I would love for him to, to, to be honest. And I would love to ask him like, honestly, do you know that the name Jesus means hell Satan? Are you aware of that? And if, if you aren't aware of it, why aren't you aware of it? You're a preacher. This is your industry. Why wouldn't you research these things? Because we know the J sound didn't exist back then. So why, why the name Jesus? His name was Yeshua. You replace the Y with the J that's Joshua. Where did Jesus come from? 
you know? So I, I would love to sit down with them and just ask them, be like, why, why do you preach these things? if you're not researching them and it's great i will say there is a lot of and i've forgotten some of the names of the youtube channels now i apologize because back when i was heavily studying the missing books of the bible i found all these youtube channels that are run by ex-pastors and there a lot of them were run by pa some baptist minister pastors minister whatever word is used i don't i forget which dom denomination uses which word but um they had started reading the lost books of the bible and by reading the lost books of, of the bible they denounced their career because they realized that they were living a lie um, and became outspoken about the missing books of the Bible and, and the fact that the church is lying to you. I mean, I rem I was talking about with them how um, church comes from a Greek goddess, demon, and it's uh, that hypnotizes you and feeds off your soul. That's what church means. And I, it makes sense. I mean, like, that's why, why don't we call it a temple? Why don't we call it? A synagogue and you know why don't we why do we call it a church uh, these are asking these questions when you talk about it, the innocent versus the knowing so i grew up in an innocent hellfire and brimstone church is that possible but it was innocent it was pure in its belief and when i was in late middle school early high school we got a new preacher and the innocence was lost and it was the business of church and it was a knowing of what was being done. So what you say just resonates so much. And then we lost one of my dear friends unexpectedly. We were juniors in college and he was killed um, for no good reason. And the church used it as a marketing tool. And it was at that point that I broke from the church because I could not believe they were using my friend's death as a marketing tool to bring the sinners in. Yeah, I, I just, I, I was done. I was absolutely done. Um, so, yeah, but I do think there is an innocence in some of it and a purity. And um, a lot of the people who raised me were the best of people and were the most loving of people. And we're just simply seeking family. Yeah. And, and it's a cultural thing too, like in the South, being a Protestant, being Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, this is all very cultural as well. Um, it's a social, it's a social environment. I will tell you, I remember when youth group started um, for me, when I was like, we had like, I think we were like 12 or 13. And we had this youth director, my first year in youth group at, at the church. And he was so cool. I don't think we ever talked about Jesus. I don't think we ever, I... And I look back now and like the way he ran the program was just so awesome. Like he had us all in there. He would like order Domino's pizza. We'd sit around and talk about music. Uh, he would ask us about our classes. You know, here are all these like 12, 13 year old innocent kids who they already know who Jesus is. Like you don't need to like just talk to them like kids, you know. And then he got a job and left and we got another youth director the next year. And that's when like all hell broke loose. This guy now that everything's come out about Bill Gothard and the IBLP and the shiny happy people documentary, I feel like this guy was on that path to bringing us into that because I, I went to a private school. And so when I got into high school, my school was a half boarding, half day school. And so the academic day would end at like three 30, but then we were required to do after school activities on campus. And I think that was because of the boarding students to keep them to keep them safe. And so we wouldn't get home until like five o'clock in the afternoon. Well, I had eight classes a day and this was a preparatory school. So they required 45 minutes to an hour's worth of homework per class every night. So I I have a lot of PTSD from high school. I have a lot of um, I would get sick a lot. Like I, It was awful. But with that being said, because of that. The Darlington kids, the kids that my church that went to my school could not do Wednesday night church anymore. Like we did in middle school. We could not do it in high school because we were stuck at the school and then we had all this homework. And on Sunday, I remember after I'd started high school, it was a Sunday school, like youth group before big church. And you walked in, they had the stage set up. And he's playing his guitar and all that kind of stuff. And this, this youth director did this sermon that all the Darlington kids were going to go to hell because we were prioritizing our school over church. And so that shit started. And I remember going, thank God for my mom, because my mom was like, God's not church. 
And my job as a parent is to make sure you're prepared for the world as an adult. So your, your school is school comes before youth group. God comes first, but the church isn't God, right? God's separate from the church. God comes first, then your school, then after school activities, which Wednesday night youth group is an after school activity. Um, I remember I was a huge, I come from a family of like big music lovers. Like I, when we were little, my mom and my dad saved all of their records from like the seventies. And I was born in 83. So I remember my sister and I would sit and play with their record player and listen to like Led Zeppelin, the who, you know, all these great bands from the seventies. And, and I'm grateful my parents still had that secular love of secular music. And so when I was in school and like Alanis Morissette was getting big and like the blues travelers and the presidents of the United States of America, y'all remember that band? Um, and so that same youth director gave this lecture about if how we had any of those CDs, there were CDs back then, we were going to go to hell. And so I was so freaked out. I remember going home and getting all of my CDs and walking to the, the, the kitchen to throw them away. My mother stopped me and she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, you know, I won't say his name, but our youth director said we're going to go to hell if, if we have this music. And my mother said, my mother goes, do you, do you find joy when you listen to your music? And I said, yes. She goes, then you keep those CDs because God is joy. So I think he... I, that, that switch happens, that switcheroo happens where, where before and we had this great youth director that would talk to us about music and would ask us like, oh, yeah, I love this band, too, or I love that band or, you know, um, and then we had this other guy who was just trying to control and he would come to my school. Like, I remember we would have these free one free period and I, all of us would use it in the library to study because we were trying to keep up. It was just so cha my college years were nothing compared to my high school. I, I had already done all those classes. And I remember being at that cubicle, like frantically studying, and he would come and take his t-shirt and put it over your head. So your head's a, this grown ass man, like I'm like 15, 16 years old, and he's I'm filling this hairy chest in my head. And I, it, it was so inappropriate. Oh, it was absolutely. so inappropriate. And, but so that's kind of, you know, you see these church groups. So talking about the knowing versus the, the innocence versus the knowing, like what was this dude doing? Like, what the fuck was he doing? Like, making us... And then I had a really good friend growing up who was Muslim. And and not, not once ever did we speak about religion. Like, I went to Ramadan at her house. Like, she would come over for Christmas. At, like, it was very respectful. Like, we were, she was just my friend. And I remember this particular evil youth, through, youth director pulling me aside once and telling me that if I didn't witness to, to my friend and her family about Jesus, if they go to hell, it's going to be my fault. And I remember going home and being so upset and my mother sat me down and she was like, I'm not going to pretend to understand the mysteries of God, but your friend and her family, they're going to be in heaven with us. Do not go there. I mean, so you see these, it's, it's, it's just, I, I just, and then apparently, and then I found out after I went off to college, um, DFAX had to get involved with this youth director because something like happened with one of the, the, the kids and the church did nothing to like punish the youth director. All they did was send them to another Presbyterian church. Talk about evil. Go do this somewhere else. Exactly. Like go, go be pray, go, go pray on some other innocent kids who, whose parents think they're doing the right thing by dropping you off at the church. And you're literally conditioning them to be in a cult. Let's talk about your mom and the strength of the woman who was able to call bullshit on some of that, even though recognizing that the church was a part of her community and a part of her system, that she was able to question and she gave that to you. Yeah, I'm very, yeah. I'm so appreciative. My mother was actually, I, I, I talked about my mother yesterday uh, or the other day with Davey from uh, IBLP and my friend Angie. Um, my mother was very cool when it came to that kind of, even though she's a conservative Christian, like she was very like, when we were little, I remember being in a Sunday school and um, my Sunday school teacher told us that animals don't go to heaven because they don't have souls. And like all the kids started crying because we all have we all have pets. And I went home and cried to my mom. And now, granted, my mother's not really an animal person. Like all of our dogs were outside dogs. Um, but my mother got so upset. She marched her southern little ass down to that church and was like, how dare you? How dare you? First of all, how abusive is that to say to a child who loves their pets? Second of all, you're not God. So how do you know? 
third of all, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the horsemen. Well, there can't be horsemen if there are no horses. So my mother was like, uh, your your dogs are going to be in heaven with you. You know, and I so I so she was very my mother could be feisty, could be sassy at times when it came to that kind of that kind of stuff. You know, so yeah, it's um I'm very grateful that she stepped in and said, No, 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 no. Maybe that's why maybe my husband, maybe that's why I did the missing books of the Bible. It was that sassiness from my mom to be like, No, no, this is not right. I mean, this came from somewhere. <laughs> well, my dad's mom, the one that had the shitty funeral, she she tried to teach me to meditate when I was eight years old, and she believed in reincarnation. So there you go. There you go. Which preacher man didn't mention that at the funeral, did he? Thanks so much, gosh. <laughs> he was a oh, those scars are, and you know, healing the wounds, the trauma of our church past, and yet sitting with the love that was there, those are hard issues to reconcile, or at least they have been for me. That's been part of the journey is reconciling the anger and the frustration and the pain and the betrayal with the love and the compassion of the people who were there That's as a you. child. Yeah. yeah. It's some um, my favorite saying these days is two things get to be true. Mm -hmm. Two things get to be true. Mm -hmm. You can have an, a narcissistic system, like a lot of churches are narcissistic systems, where there is narcissistic abuse in a system, but you can also have really good memories from the people you grew up with at church, the the kids you went to Sunday school with, the you know some a few of the adults that were really great to you. You know, two things get to be true, um, and I think that's that's a bigger discussion too when it comes to like narcissistic abuse. I've been in a narcissistic relationship. My boyfriend has been. I know you went through a rough divorce, and that's why it's so hard for people, I think, to leave those relationships because two things get to be true. There can be an intense amount of abuse, but there can also still be love, and so that's why it's so hard for people to pull themselves away. Um, it, is that it's that complexity of being human and having com complex thoughts and feelings and. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I mean, I'll tell you one funny story too about my church. So my sister, when she married her husband, my sister's got a great husband, comes from a really good family and, but they're Catholic. Um, his mom's family is from Italy and we, there's not many Catholics down here in the South. Like we're very Protestant down here. So very rare to find someone who's like Catholic. And um, Stephen's family, his dad was always Methodist, but his mom raised him Catholic because of the Italian heritage. And that was really important to my brother-in-law that, that their kids be raised Catholic just to hold on to some of that Italian heritage. Not a lot of Italians down here in the South either. That's mostly the, the New England area or New York. Um, we're mostly British down here. Um, so when my, when my nephew was born, uh, my sister asked me to be his godmother. Cause they do that in the Catholic, they don't, we don't do godparents in the Protestant church, but the Catholic church. Yes. And so I had to go take these classes to be his godmother because I'm not Catholic. So I had to go take, I'm a nerd. So I love taking these classes. I was like, any day I'll take these classes. Well, I had to get from my, from the Presbyterian church. I had to get um, the program from Easter of 1983 when I was baptized. So they had proof that I had been baptized with water, like water had been put on my head. They had to have that proof so that I could qualify to be his godmother. Well, I called the the church I grew up in to get them to see if they can send me on file. So I could, and I explained um, why I needed it so I could be my, my nephew's godmother. And the person on the other was so rude and nasty to me. She was like, Catholics are going to hell. So I'm not going to send you this. And I said, this, this is my baptism. This is my nephew. I, I, this is my paperwork. I need this. My grandfather, who was alive at the time, he was an elder at the church and a walker was so pissed he drove his big ass lincoln because all old people get lincolns a hundred percent or Christless. down down to the church <laughs> with his walker he ho hovered in there and he was like i need my granddaughters and i don't think they realized that's who i was i don't think that, that they realized i was ed watson's granddaughter because he gave a lot of money and he got the paperwork for me so that i could go and be but i mean that's that's the the arrogance just the arrogance of that secretary at the first Presbyterian church to say, I'm not giving you your paperwork because your nephew and your sister and your brother-in-law are going to go to hell because they're Catholics. The arrogance. Where is the love? 
it's evil. It's pure evil, isn't it? There's pure enough. evil. I got baptized twice. I was afraid the first time didn't take. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> a lot with baptism. I got dumped all the way down. In, in yeah, because you're Baptist, church, right? I all the way. I got dumped twice because I was afraid. I was afraid for my soul. <laughs> I've heard that. Who who was that comedian that said he had been baptized like seven times? Like he would go and do a sin <laughs> and then come back and get baptized. Like, like I'm a gold star kind of kid, you know. Like I just needed that gold star twice on the chart. I yes. just need, I need a reassurance. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> we're good yeah because you you baptists you guys dunk we don't dunk in the presbyterian church we just sprinkle we do it as babies so you don't even remember your baptism and they just sprinkle water on your head like my children were baptized in the presbyterian church yeah and the people said amen but yes. yeah in the baptist church you get suited up in these like i don't know like spacesuit type things that were sort of water resistant and they would balloon up on you and you'd go down the stairs. So there's the girls changing room and the guys changing room and you'd be in there. you like, you'd be a five-year-old kid with a 70 year old woman who had gotten Jesus. Right. And you get suited up in these things and you'd go down and the pastor would be in his white flowing robe in the water and you would get dumped in front of the whole church. And then you were okay. Like it was a recognition of your profession of faith, but I have to say that the the back, like the changing room was kind of fun to hang out in, you know? So anyway. you want a social experiment? Just go and get baptized a bunch of times. Go do it. <laughs> I mean, the Presbyterian Church, what, they take the baby, they hold the, they put the water on the baby's head, they hold the baby up, they make the congregation say, do you agree to help raise this child, blah, 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 blah. And everyone goes, I do, I do. They put the baby, the baby used to cry a little bit, and then the mama or the daddy. The daddy holds the baby, though. The mom doesn't even hold the baby. It's the father that holds the baby. Um, In ours, the, the pastor went around with my babies. Oh, really? Well, yeah, the I father would – so the father brought the baby. The mother just stood there. I, I mean, bless her heart. She just pushed that child out of her body, and now she's just going to have to stand there like a side piece. Um, the father brings it up, hands it to the pastor. The pastor or the father holds the baby while the pastor does the dunking of the water. Um, and then they have the pastor holds the baby up like Simba from the Lion King. Yes. Takes uh, it around the church. So everyone yeah. can see this baby. And you know, the baby just starts crying at that point. It's just had cold water put on its head. Bless its heart. Um, and, and then the mother, mama. yeah. And then the mother gets the baby afterwards and has to take the baby back to the nursery afterwards because the baby can't sit throughout the whole baptism. Yeah. It's a thing. My nephew, when he, cause you know, Catholics in Presbyterian church, the baptism is like what? Five, 10 minutes. Very quick. Catholics. It's a whole mass. So when my nephew got baptized, they use a bunch of oils and they warned my sister that sometimes with babies, when they use the oils, it will relax their digestive system. So they'll get blowouts. Well, the pastor or the preacher was priest was holding my nephew up with all this oil, this chubby baby. And all of a sudden the biggest fart just ricochets throughout the whole mass from Charlie. And of course my immature ass, started laughing <laughs> and I could not stop. And my sister kept nudging me and I'm like, I'm like, Susan, like trying not to lose it. I'm like, we can't hold it together. No, we still got like, we still got like 30 minutes left of a whole baptism ceremony to go to. And my nephew just literally shat his pants. Meanwhile, they're in this beautiful gown, this traditional like family heirloom type situation. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and 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 my my side of the family that was there is all Protestant. So you see the 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 what the my my side, my sister's side, and none of them know what to do because we don't kneel in the Presbyterian Church. So we're just don't even know what to do. And all and then the Catholic side, the Italian side, they're all like gold chain lur lurking, like you know mafioso looking dudes from Italy. It was hysterical. And then there's Charlie, my nephew, and Charlie. You know, my, my brother-in-law is very Italian, very, he's got blue eyes, but very dark. And so I just assumed that the babies would come out dark, but Charlie came out like blonde. And like, so he looked like my sister, like my very, just kind of like shit in his pants while he's getting saved, <laughs> by, saved by the Lord, you know, um, out demon out, I say. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's all, it's, I mean, even my boyfriend was baptized and he told his parents at like 12 years old, he wasn't going to church anymore. So 
it took me till college to say I wasn't going to church anymore. And that was a whole thing because it's interesting when your parents choose the church instead of you. But that's another story for another day. I will say about the baptism and all that. I think there is something restful to Mm -hmm. ritual. There is something commemorative to ritual. We have to be careful that we understand what the ritual is about. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I've, I, I did a deep dive into baptisms on my own and I don't even know if I've talked about them on my channel. Cause you know, so my boyfriend's family um, settled the whole Tampa Bay, Sarasota area back in like the 1800s. And there's a Methodist church down there that his great, 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 whatever grandfather actually built. And that is where his parents still go to church. And that's where he was baptized. And I always thought if we did have a child, then I would have them baptized because of ritual, because of family in that church, because that would be his heritage. But then I found out what baptism was, like the the root of that. Do you know what the root of it is? Oh. You know why you are white? Why they anoint, they're anointing you for sacrifice? Well, one time I wore white in the spacesuit, and one time I wore red. Oh, girl. <laughs> okay, just saying. <laughs> I mean, they're not really sacrificing kids now, obviously, but but um, when I researched that with the root of where that comes from, I was like, holy shit. I was like that. I don't know if I'm comfortable with this now, like, I, you know, but uh, but yeah, it's it's um, there is that cultural thing, though, that's there and it is very innocent. And that's I mean, that's the yoga practice. The yoga practice is a daily ritual. It's it is in itself a da- daily like good baptism because you're cleansing yourself before you start your day, you know, so it's um, but it's so I mean, I could nerd out on all the secret hidden messaging and, and and i'm sure there's even more in other fates too that i haven't even like looked into yet you know it's um from what the cassiopeians say though it's basically the abrahamic faith so christianity islam and judaism that are really corrupted and that have really the other ones not so much so okay so so we were we were the lucky lotto winners that got put in the, in the corrupt ones <laughs> <laughs> so but at the end of the day yeah. all that matters is your intention all that matters is is what's in your heart and if you're willing to be of service to humanity and all that kind of stuff so girl we've been going for over an hour i could talk to you all day and i cannot okay. wait to have you back we can do so many episodes i definitely want to do um an episode on your your past with as you said you before we started filming you're like i've represented satan so many times <laughs> yeah I was, I, i'm a corporate lawyer you yeah. know so I've seen a lot of things and um, had a lot of great experiences as a result, but I have represented every form of Satan. Yes. So we definitely are going to do another episode on that. We'll do that one on Rumble so we can speak freely. And I do want to do one about the idea of like what that's like to go through the trauma of parents choosing a religion over their children. Um, because we've been doing a lot of cults here on this channel as well. I've had some Scientologists on. I've had um, obviously Davey from the IBLP on. I've uh I've had a Kelly, my friend Kelly Teal from Nexium. So I would love to to explore that more because I think a lot of people do experience that rejection um, over you know religion over over the person. So well, all right, you guys. Once again, please, all of Ashley's links to her blog to her podcast are all down in the description box below. So make sure that you go and you hit that subscribe button um, and you start listening to her podcast because Ashley, I know her off camera. She is delightful. She's an incredible human being. She's hysterical. And so I, I, I'm sure that you all will enjoy her podcast very much. And Ashley, I can't wait to have you back on. Let's do it. This was Let's- so, this is just great. It made my whole day. Oh, me too. Me too. All right, you guys, we will talk to you soon. Bye everybody.